So today's episode is going to be a little different. I'm a fan of the Live Fully with Kratom podcast from my friends over at Ethan Natural Botanicals. They have an episode titled, FDA Dosing Study Reveals Kratom is Safe. It's 32 minutes long, and I'm going to play it for you now. It features Etha's co-founder, Alexander, along with Amanda, who is head of customer service. It's an insightful conversation and so interesting to hear that the FDA is now confirming that Kratom is well tolerated at all doses. Take a listen to this. I'll come back on at the end. Welcome to Kratom Stories, a weekly podcast where we share stories of how this amazing plant has changed our lives. I'm your host, Madeline Sklar. Each week, I'll bring you a new episode featuring interviews with experts, advocates, and everyday people who've experienced the benefits of Kratom firsthand. Join me as we dive deeper into the world of this botanical wonder and discover the amazing stories behind this incredible plant. The Kratom Stories podcast is presented solely for educational purposes. Neither the podcast nor its hosts promote or endorse the use of Kratom, a substance not yet regulated or approved by the FDA. The views and opinions expressed by guests are theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect those of the host or the podcast. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions regarding the use of Kratom. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to let you know about Kratom Real Talk. It's a new community for positive, uplifting discussions about the power of whole leaf Kratom. If you'd like to be part of the conversation and learn more about this plant or contribute your knowledge, go to KratomRealTalk.com. So today's topic was actually kind of brought up when you and I were just talking about something. I don't know. We have a lot of side conversations about a lot of things. I like to pick your brain sometimes. And you brought this article up or the study and you started telling me about it. And I was like, wow, this is a great topic to talk about on the podcast. Not only are we a manufacturer that creates amazing, amazing, amazing Kratom that's safe, trustworthy, transparent and all the above. But we're very, 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 very passionate about the advocacy behind Kratom, making sure the community is aware of anything that's changing regarding Kratom legalities and all that stuff. And we just want to make sure that everybody's aware of what's going on so that we can be up to date. And a lot of people sometimes are very scared of things that they don't know about. So the more information we could put out there other than just our own research, kind of like what's happening now, I think is great because a lot of people don't have, don't even know about the American Kratom Association. When customers come in, I ask them how they learn about Kratom and all that stuff. And then they ask sometimes, like, how can I encourage my family to try Kratom Mm -hmm. other than just like, hey, this works for me. And a lot of people are a little intimidated by Kratom sometimes. And American Kratom Association is a good source to kind of do some research yourself and kind of see, like, the advocacy and the, the backbone to the community. And, you know, we're really trying to make a good positive change for Kratom. And... It's yes. a good source. Yeah. yeah. And and what's amazing is that, I mean, we've been talking about Kratom for years now mm-hmm. and there has, there is quite a bit of research in some ways where there's a lot of animal and mice studies on the active ingredients in Kratom. And then there's these user surveys that are kind of the self-reported customer surveys of people who consume Kratom and why they use it, what their effects are. But we kind of, over the last several years, now what's happening is the research kind of bridging the gap between those is Mm -hmm. being researched and studied and starting to slowly be published. And so that's that's the amazing part is that the science of Kratom is basically taking what we know about the pharmacokinetic side and then these user surveys. And now we're finally starting to see the human trials that are essentially confirming what is kind of known from both of those types of research. And so this is happening both at University of Florida, as well as the FDA is doing quite a bit of their own research. And actually, that is what the Federal Kratom Consumer Protection Act is requiring the FDA to do, is actually publish the research they are producing and the information coming out, because it is going to be helpful for people as far as how are there 15 million people in this country that are currently consuming Kratom in a very safe manner. That doesn't mean that all Kratom isn't 
I mean, every substance has certain risks to it or has a proper use and improper use. Mm -hmm. So rather than just trying to kind of fear monger that we saw back in 2016, how does the FDA actually provide real information that will help people consume Kratom properly, safely, and effectively? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I think since 2016, there's been at least 450 published peer-reviewed papers on Kratom. So oh, it's just, wow. yeah, the, the growing evidence is absolutely amazing. It's very, very fascinating. A couple episodes ago, we, me and Victor talked about how the Kratom industry has progressed since we started. In the beginning, when I started looking into Kratom, it was kind of intimidating, a little scary. And I can understand the customer's point of view, like, oh, why are you guys doing this? This is kind of scary stuff. Mm -hmm. And then now... Luckily, we have this amazing podcast that spreads awareness, and we get a lot of customers that actually listen to our podcast, and I've been learning a lot. And the fresher breath air that I get sometimes where like a customer goes, oh, I already know what it is. They have more than just the basic, and I'm not saying it's thanks to us, because I'm sure there's other places that they learn from, but I'm glad that the community is slowly improving itself from when we started about, what, eight years ago or something like that. And studies like these help. So that we also have not only our personal experience through us and through our customers and their friends and family, but we have something to kind of show the science behind it that, hey, this is not so scary. You know, this is pretty good and it does work and it's effective. And there's a lot of science behind it that we're still learning and it's still improving. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so what happened was University of Florida put on their third annual Kratom Symposium on February 14th and 15th. And as part of that, it was uh, a lot of the researchers we've talked about in the past, Dr. Chris McCurdy, Oliver Grunman, a few others that have you know, really been studying Kratom and, and allowing us to understand this plant and really kind of help us be able to use it properly. And so what's fascinating is that during these kind of uh, symposiums and conferences, the researchers will provide some of their in-progress research. And so this is what happened was that the FDA came into the symposium and gave an update on their progress of what they are looking to kind of provide more information around Kratom. And so the FDA's goal is to provide a human abuse potential study. And so this is probably going to take another two to four years before that full study is completed. But in order to start that study, they needed to do what is called a dose finding study. So this is taking human subjects, normal people who are generally healthy, and giving them a dose of Kratom and seeing how they respond. So what, what the FDA wants to do is make sure that we're not going to you know, harm anybody with kind of just a small amount of Kratom. And they keep increasing that amount of Kratom to see when an adverse event would happen. And that's kind of the foundation for this next phase of that human abuse potential. Do you know what an adverse event would be considered to them? An adverse event can be anything as simple as nausea. So anything that kind of somebody will say, oh, I feel uncomfortable, I feel nauseous, that is considered an mm -hmm. adverse event. Or it can be as extreme as, you know, even when we talk about pharmaceuticals and opioids, an adverse event would be also be considered if somebody, you know, passes away or dies off of opioids. Oh, so well, adverse event extreme. is anything yeah. that's negative that you don't want to happen, whether oh, it's okay. just kind of a a mental issue or even the full extreme of a morbidity. And what did they find? Or So what they did is they took, I believe, 12 subjects and they kept giving them higher amounts of Kratom. And the maximum dose they gave them was 12 grams of Kratom in a 20 to 30 minute period. Oh, so wow. this is 24 capsules they had to consume in, tw in 20 minutes. Oh my minutes. God, I would pass wow. off from trying to take them. That, I could barely take one. Exactly. So <laughs> even at taking 12 grams of Kratom, which I mean, I only take two and a half grams of Kratom as my normal consumption amount. Uh -huh. And so almost six times the amount I would normally take. Two grams throughout the day or at a dose? Um, I take two and a half grams as a single dose generally. Okay. And then, well, if I, and that'll be kind of in the morning. So if, if my pain is bad, I'll take two and a half grams. And then if my pain is still kind of comes back in the afternoon, I'll generally take about 1.9 to two grams, like kind of a little so bit lower. So you would stay under like five at the most. Oh, yes. For uh -huh. the whole day. Correct. Uh -huh. And so in this study, when these subjects took 12 grams of Kratom in 20 minutes, only two out of the 12 reported nausea. And that was the, that was the worst 
It's probably from event. the stress of trying to swallow yeah, everything. Yeah, right. It can Honestly. be. I mean, yeah. If I had to take and the air bubbles you're getting from the capsules. Yes. If I had to take twelve grams of vitamin C, I'm sure I would be nauseous or yeah. any or some vitamin. Right. It's a, it's it's a so it's a very. I mean, from our side, from consumer, from the consumer side, it's very encouraging that yeah, like this is. I mean, this is what we have seen with kratom. Mm-hmm. I mean, I know when Victor and I experimented I with was thirty bring that grams, up. Uh-huh. that was kind of the. The worst thing we had was nausea, stomach aches, and we kind of, and I had some constipation for a couple hours. So it's to give you guys some context, Alex and Victor are very competitive, of course, and they love to do like tests on themselves to see how much their body can handle and stuff. So they did have like this little, I guess, competition, friendly competition of how much can they consume before they feel anything, you know? Mm -hmm. And it took how many grams of kratom before you felt anything? Well, I mean, this was, uh, I was trying to see. At a very high dose of kratom, what the adverse events would be for myself personally, and kind of start that kind of you know self experimentation, because we didn't have this study. Well, back in 2017, we were kind of going through that process, mm-hmm. and I also wanted to see if the kind of that anecdotal evidence that people claim at low dose kratom is stimulating, high dose sedating. It was like, well, oh. I have trouble sleeping, so this could be great for me. So that was kind of my, like, I wanted to see if I could get better sleep as well as kind of testing kind of the limits of Kratom. Mm -hmm. And I took 30 grams of our tablets, which was a lot of material to to eat and swallow. But way easier, I'm sure, than the capsules, but... (laughs) Yes. I mean, capsules for me, anytime I, I do take other dietary supplements and anytime I take a lot of capsules, I do notice that because there's so much air inside the capsule, I'll Mm -hmm. swallow it digest it. And then I don't know, maybe half an hour later, I'll kind of burp a little bit. And sometimes I get that air and like, and it tastes like the capsule again, or some of the power comes out. I'm like, well, that, that's not pleasant. So tablets, Kratom tablets are much better for me than Kratom capsules for sure. When you take your supplements, do you eat or anything? You just take them? I mean, it, it just really depends on my eating habits, which are generally very, I don't know, I'll call it sporadic sometimes or you just eat when you can. Yes. It's kind of like, I need then, to eat, I need to eat. So it's not like kind of like, you know. Yeah. The only reason I ask is because I, I read an article a while ago and I mentioned it before in the podcast, is that a doctor came out with a study or something and I have to look for it to show you, that it's important to make sure you're eating when you take your vitamins because then you trick your body into like releasing like, I want to say like a lubricant that mm. will consume or absorb the vitamins better than like if it was an empty stomach. And a lot of the times when you take it on an empty stomach, the vitamins or whatever you're taking is not being absorbed and just getting stuck there. So now think of all the capsule ingredients and stuff and the additives that they need to use to put in there. It's just stuck and floating in there. So that's why they say like eat an apple or something just to kind of have your body make that lubrication so that it can absorb and all that. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That is the nice part about taking whole leaf kratom. So either our whole leaf tablets or our powder versus some of the concentrated liquids out there. I do notice that when I take the whole leaf kratom that we sell, it's a more gentle experience for me Mm -hmm. and I kind of have a nice sustained release. It's almost like this natural extended release because the fiber is maybe slowly releasing the alkaloids versus Mm -hmm. the liquid is all at once and I kind of, it's a little bit too much sometimes. So 30 grams is what you took and what did you feel? A little bit of nausea, stomach ache, and that was pretty minor for me, mm-hmm. but then I did have constipation for about mm-hmm. three hours oh, and okay. still not, I mean, so nothing, I mean, it's, I don't want to repeat that necessarily, but it's also you. nothing, I don't know, detrimental. I mean, I've, I've had much worse experiences of taking too much whey protein. I've had that kind of problem that was much more noticeable and, mm-hmm. and more impactful or, or memorable for me compared to the Kratom side. Did you feel sedating or sedated? Or no, did you feel unfortunately, that? I was sitting in bed and then... With your eyes wide open? Yeah, I, I basically was like, okay, well, I'm going to do some emails or work for a little bit until I start feeling sleepy, then I'll go to bed. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I don't know, maybe two or three hours later, I was like, well, I'm just super focused and working and I don't want to go to sleep right now. So it was not, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately... And we've kind of talked about that before where, yes, there are different effects of Kratom, can be everything from the discomfort relief, the mood boosting, that perception of energy, kind of awakefulness to some of the anti-anxiety relaxation. Mm -hmm. And that is due to the different alkaloids because there is a complex pharmacokinetic effect from this plant. 
but it's not just simply mitragynine at low doses, stimulating, high doses, sedating. That doesn't quite work. And I think that's also supported by some of Chris McCurdy's, Dr. Chris McCurdy at the University of Florida, and some of his studies when they give too much kratom to a mouse and mm-hmm. essentially kind of get it into a, a overdose status. He says it looks more like a seizure, like more stimulating. It doesn't have the same response of opiates are, are very clearly just a depressant where the more and more opiates are given to a mouse, the mouse will start to move slower and slower. The breathing will kind of reduce and get slower, slower. So that's a true sedating hmm. effect which we don't necessarily, we don't see that same correlation to the kratom side which is also why it has a much lower liability when it comes to risk of potential of kind of respiratory depression and so that's basically the the finding from the FDA is that kratom is well tolerated at all doses they're now moving forward with their human abuse potential study to really start you know providing accurate information about kratom Good. Well, it's absolutely yeah, and that's first hurdle done. <laughs> yes, but unfortunately, we do still have. I mean, what's unfortunate is that the FDA is not going to release this information fully until November of this year. Oh, and how so, did we get a hold of that then, or how did well, they, because AKA... it, it's because of the kratom symposium. So it's oh, kind okay. of the you know they're still doing their due diligence, kind of communicating out, and and I think there also has been a massive restructuring of the FDA behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. So this happened several months ago. And with the, essentially Congress is starting to kind of help the FDA get back to their mission statement and really start to look at these natural compounds, really kind of start to provide the truth in labeling, really help consumers understand how to obtain the products that we want to obtain. So this applies both to CBD and Kratom. The FDA is now changing their stance and saying, okay, they're going to start working with their regulatory tools, working with the industry to actually help manufacturers produce products that meet their guidelines because the FDA can do a lot of great things. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we still, you know, that's, we base a lot of our GMP, our good manufacturing practices on the guidelines from the FDA. Mm-hmm. And so we kind of incorporate their best practices, what the FDA has learned, you know, over decades now of how to manufacture foods, how to manufacture supplements and drugs from that standpoint of they have a lot of rich history Uh and they also have a lot of the FDA does know how to properly implement warnings, so to speak. That's what they do really well. And so an example that Dr. Jack Henningfield gave, and this was at our, was it in December? We went out to Washington, D.C. for the Congressional briefing on Kratom, Dr. Jack Henningfields gave the analogy that when the FDA was creating warnings for nicotine gum, they didn't say pregnant women don't take nicotine gum because to your point, if there's these warnings that scare people completely away from it, that could actually cause more harm. And in the sense is that if somebody is choosing to smoke cigarettes, which we know is very bad because it's the nicotine plus it's all the other chemicals from the burning of the plant material, Mm -hmm. you get a lot of terrible chemicals into your body. Well, if somebody is pregnant and they switch to nicotine gum instead of smoking, that is a better, you know, it's a step in the right direction to reduce harm without causing kind of that fear-based system of like, well, don't do this. Mm -hmm. The warning is, well, if you're pregnant, go talk to your healthcare provider because on an individual case or an individual basis, this may be better for you than what you're currently doing. And that's the overall message that we want to kind of get out there is, you know, there's, we want to know the true information of what are the true warnings, if there are warnings there, or based on, you know, individual use cases, how do we provide that information so that people can make the best choice for themselves individually, working with their healthcare professional, working with their individual circumstance to really increase the benefit of society. I think that if they want to do that and say, go to your healthcare professional, they need to provide some kind of training too. Absolutely. Because a lot of customers that do come in, they're like, hey, I talked to my doctor about it and they know nothing about it. And it's kind of sad, unless you go to like a natural homopathic kind of doctor, they'll be more aware of it a little bit. But even so, like, I don't think there's enough training in, well, I don't know how the medical stuff works, but it's a like, very just a complicated, touch base. Yeah. yes. I mean, especially too, because doctors are under a lot of pressure to Mm -hmm. see more and more patients. I mean, medical industry is constantly changing, if not 
it's got to be changing faster now than ever in the past. I mean, just like, I mean, same thing with, you know, on a consumer side of technology, that's changing faster than it ever has. And so the medical industry is changing faster for doctors. And so now they're required to keep up with even more continuing education. It's a hard process for them to go through. But I think, yeah, if we can hopefully get our regulatory agencies to help in that manner, providing accurate information, that would be a good start forward. And so that is really the, that federal Kratom Consumer Protection Act is all around mandating that the FDA publish this type of research rather than keeping it secret. I mean, so I think at least the FDA has plans to publish it now because last year the FDA was trying to do this study, but they wanted to be the gatekeeper for the information and try to only release the information if it fit their narrative, which was very weird because the FDA is a public institution. It's intended to be paid for by tax dollars, but there is this kind of conflict of interest of new drug applications fund about 60 to 75 percent of the FDA. So we know there's kind of this little bit of conflict of interest that has been getting a little bit worse and worse over the years. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of part of what has been forcing Congress to help the FDA reevaluate their mission and kind of restructure. So I think there is some potential good news for us consumers that the FDA is starting to get back to their actual mission. Mm -hmm. Small baby steps. And so way better than before, though. Before it was a lot of red tape. So. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's a then, good start. Yep. And actually this only came out because, and so I say uh, the FDA is, there was a court case in December and January of this year because one of the original importers of Kratom, Sebastian Gunthry, who was actually one of the original founders of the American Kratom Association, oh, okay. he did a lot of great for Kratom as far as you know, making it available to people who needed it. He, he saw the need of forming the American Kratom Association, and that part was amazing. This is you know years ago, so he is one of the legacy members of the American Kratom Association advocates. And so that's the other cool thing, too, is that American Kratom Association is starting to recognize all of the people who have been contributing because it is a consumer nonprofit advocacy group, and it's really dependent on advocates going out there telling our stories making sure that you know, we're not scared to say, hey, I use Kratom for my back pain. I use Kratom for all these other needs that really help me. But unfortunately, because of the way the FDA had a shadow ban on Kratom, he did choose to import Kratom illegally, which is mm-hmm. why he was taken to court and pled guilty for doing that. But during that process, the prosecutor also wanted to claim that oh, not only was this individual importing a substance and misidentifying it, which is just illegal no matter what substance you're importing, you have to properly identify it. But the prosecutor is trying to say that not only was he doing that, this was also a very dangerous substance. And the judge said, okay, well, if you're going to say it's dangerous, I want the FDA to come to court and say that it's dangerous. But this was just a couple months ago, the FDA refused to come to court to say that Kratom was dangerous because they had not made up their mind. And so even though the, so the FDA has not said Kratom is dangerous, but yet we still see certain cities, municipalities, or states that are trying to potentially ban Kratom because they're using information from several years ago when the FDA was saying that Kratom was dangerous. So there's a lot of this confusion going on. And it's very like to your point of people will research Kratom and they come up with these articles, old articles, old information, because the real science information that is currently going on in the background is not being published yet. Oh, I don't know all that part. Interesting. So they called the bluff. They said, mm, maybe, maybe, yep. maybe not. But then they were forced to yes. display yes. or to present it. Well, I'm glad they were forced so that the information can be out there, something updated. But speaking about old information that people mm-hmm. are referencing to, I know yesterday you went up to Huntington Beach? Newport Beach. Newport. Newport Beach, oh, California. Newport. I did the emails. I should know. <laughs> Newport Beach for a call to action kind of thing by the AKA to go tell your story. And mm-hmm. how did that go? Well, unfortunately, actually in February, Newport Beach decided to make steps to putting a ban in for Kratom in their city. So it can't be sold, can't be distributed. It's completely, that was the recommendation. And yesterday was their final vote and their public hearing on Kratom. And so even though we had the American Kratom Association came out with four of their members, former House Representative, also a Senator in the U.S. Senate, 
And they came out telling their story of, hey, look, Newport Beach was basing their information on the old FDA stance of, Uh oh, Kratom is dangerous. And they cited these articles from several years ago. They also looked at the, the DEA that has labeled Kratom as a drug of concern, which is another confusing part because the reason the DEA has Kratom listed as a drug of concern is not because of Kratom itself, but because Kratom has the potential to be adulterated or contaminated, that makes it potentially dangerous. And so that's why the F- or the DEA still has that listed because they still want to be aware of it if somebody is adding something they should not be adding to Kratom because mm-hmm. that could cause a problem. And so Newport Beach was relying on old information and confusing the actual intent or the actual reasons behind it. And so they were moving forward with a ban. And even though the American Kratom Association came and was trying to educate them on the current science and the actual published research... Did you bring that up? Oh, they did. Yes. They brought up a lot of these issues. And I think the other part is because the American Kratom Association has been able to make so much headway in the Kratom Consumer Protection Act and stopping other bans Mm -hmm. in different cities or states. Actually, five of the, there are currently five states that have a ban on Kratom from 2016. And this was from the misinformation that FDA put out there. Four of those states have active legislation. They're going through the process to reverse the ban and implement the Creative Consumer Protection Act. And so that's the thing. I I understand the confusion that was caused years ago because of the lies from the FDA. But it's very weird that, you know, this happened just yesterday with the city. And that is the unfortunate part when if advocates, if we're not getting out there and telling our story and showing up at these meetings, then there's going to be more confusion and potential bans coming. And so unfortunately, Newport Beach did vote to outlaw Kratom in their city. Was there a specific incident that caused this? It's just like, hey, today we're just going to ban Kratom kind of thing. There was no, I don't know what the word is. There was no event. Yeah, there there was no event that caused them to do it. It was simply everything that they referenced in their legislation, like Mm -hmm. I said, was either old information from the FDA or misinformation or kind of confusing the real intent around that product. And so that's the hard part is if advocates aren't out there constantly getting in front of these issues and helping educate the council members or the legislators before this happens, it's going to be much harder to correct those situations. So please go out there. This is a call to action to you guys to make sure that whenever something like that, we're, we try to be really good about like sharing through if you are in our newsletter we always try to include it in there when there is some kind of event like this where we strongly encourage you guys to go down to whatever. If you're in the area, I mean, you don't have to make all these kinds of accommodations, but if it's in your city or your state or something, please go out there and share your story. The more people that share, the more people will be more accepting or receptive to it. Mm-hmm. And they won't think it's a big, scary thing. No. Thankfully, it's not like that as much anymore. But I mean, there's still some work to do. So. Yes. Yeah. And it is, I mean, it is very intimidating. I would say it's, I mean, I've done several of these now, but going to a council meeting where there's members kind of sitting up at these tall desks and we're kind of down on the floor, kind yeah. of looking up, it, it, it is very intimidating and you go up in front of a microphone and, but it's okay. I mean, it, it, the more we do it, the more we get out there, it is a, you know, it's coming together as a community and really nice for that standpoint. Now, after COVID and stuff, you could do a virtual, I believe, in some of them. And then you can just send emails too. So it doesn't have Correct. to be like in person if you are a little intimidated by that scary, you know, atmosphere or the environment. But you can send an email. You can sign up with the AKA at American Creative Association dot org, I think. American Kratom, yes, American Kratom Association dot org. Uh-huh. And another good website is protect dot org, which is mm-hmm. a sister site that is also run by the American Kratom Association to help put out the correct information. And so example, these this study that we referenced is on the American Kratom Association dot org mm-hmm. website on their news section. They are very good about keeping everyone updated and kind of promoting the science, the the real articles that are happening behind the scenes sometimes. The AK is doing a great job about getting that information out to everyone. Yeah, and if you want to sign up for the newsletter and we me and Alex and I get notifications for the most part. And there's and there's updates or changes or anything. And if you don't get on theirs and we try mm-hmm. our best to announce it also. 
events. Yeah. I mean, there are also other side benefits to going to these events. So even though it's a, you know, the ban and the reason these council members are kind of looking at Kratom is a negative situation for us, there is positive that come from it. We're just other Kratom consumers. We get to see each other and, and share our stories and how and why we use Kratom. And even from that, there were some members or people in the audience that heard at least about my story about I use Kratom for my degenerating disc. And this young lady came up saying, oh, my father has a degenerating disc and he's tried everything and he's feeling really horrible. Can I get some more information about Kratom and see if he'd like to try it? Oh, that's cool. So, so that's the other side benefit is that the more we share our stories, even though it kind of sometimes seems like we're just going out there and sharing our story, there are other people that are listening and potentially learning about our situation and maybe we can help those people just by kind of, yeah, seeing what we do with Kratom and, and if we can help others. I wonder if this person came into the conference just to see like how scary it is and then came out with like, hey, it's not so scary because I heard Alex's story and yeah, she resonated with uh, your degenerated disc with her dad and then she, you know, kind of helped her sway her opinion. In yeah, a it was a, it was the first time I think she heard about Kratom and she was very interested just from that oh, standpoint okay. of the story I shared. But yeah, and I'm not, yeah, I did, I did not understand or I did not ask why she was there to begin mm -hmm. with. But yeah, it was a it was kind of one of those little, you know, positive moments that come yeah. out of a, a negative situation. Cool. A lot of good information and, you know, encouraging you guys to go out there and advocate for not only yourselves, but just the community as well. So Baby steps for the FDA, and I guess look for it in November to be an official post, I guess, or announcement, or do they, the study, do they, are they going to announce it or just kind of like I think in the, in in the November <laughs> time frame, they'll, okay. they'll maybe announce it and kind of start to, but they're going to be very, I think, slow and, yeah. and diligent about putting that information out there. All right, I'm back. I knew you would find that interesting. I want to thank Etha Botanicals for letting me share that recording with you. So I'll be back next week with another awesome episode of the Kratom Stories podcast. Thank you for listening. You can get more information at kratomstoriespodcast.com, including show notes from this episode. <laughs>